attachment. The attachment. No, that's right. That hand. It's all right. It's good in here because it is very silent, so we don't need it. Is this the first time in the church? No, many times. But we talk about uh, Atya in the church the first time. Very good. <laughs> Yesterday I told you about this chakra, which is a very fiery chakra because this chakra is occupied by a very fiery deity called as Jagadamba, is the mother of the universe. She has to protect her children who are trying to swim across the ocean of illusion and who are being always hampered by the people who are against God, who are anti-Christ, who are anti-God, who are devils, who are called as Rakshasas. And so she has to protect them and that's why she's such a fiery goddess, like a tigress. Actually one of her, her conveyance is a tiger, another is a lion. After that, now, today we want to know about this chakra, which is the Vishuddhi chakra, Vishuddhi. America, in the map of the world, is this center, is Vishuddhi chakra. That's why it is important to understand what do we stand for, America. Now this center has got sixty subplexes and it manifests in the gross, the cervical plexus, which looks after all the ear, nose, throat, the eyeballs and the neck, all the problems of this area. The facial construction depends on this chakra. Whatever is the condition of the center, you have the expression on your face. As I told you, it has got sixteen subplexes, and all the vowels are created in this center. Of course, English language has got the vowels which are not scientifically all right, but the Devanagari script has got all the vowels are sixteen in number and that's why they are all produced here in this area. This is the gross side of the center. The subtle side of this center is that this is the center of collectivity. When raise, man raises his head, he sees around himself his fellow men. And he starts thinking that there must be something very, very common between us. That we are part and parcel of one universal being, of the great primordial personality. The central path of Sushumna, of Ascendant, creates this primordial being ultimately, is the final, is the complete form of this ascendance of the evolution ends up here. So this is the primordial being, if you say this is the primordial being and this is the primordial Vishuddhi, then this Vishuddhi is the one that represents what Muslims say as the Akbar, Akbar aspect of God, the primordial great being. In Sanskrit language it is called as Virat. Now, this primordial being incarnated on this earth, as I told you that all this aspect incarnates, the central aspect on this earth as Sri Krishna. And he is 
power was Radha. Ra means energy, Dha means the one who sustains. Ra, Dha means the one who sustains the energy is Radha. So on the center is Shri Krishna and Radha. On the right side is his image as a king. When he went away from Gokul and Mathura after killing a devil called Kansa, who was his uncle actually, he went down to Gujarat and settled down there and ruled that country. There he was called as Vithala, Vithala and Rukmini. I am telling you these names because when you are raising the Kundalini, if the chakra stops there or Kundalini stops there, you have to take his name. On the left hand side is his sister who was just born and was killed again and she appears to us as a lightning in the sky. She is called as Vishnu Maya. All these three centers are very, very important. When you are collecting, then you are ascending through this center. The power is passing through this. Actually, the root of this starts from here. The root starts from here and grows into this and then into this, crossing over. The crossing over takes there, but the root of the ego and superego starts at this point. Shri Krishna, as we know, appeared to Arjuna as a Virata, as the very primordial being. He saw him as a very huge big personality and he saw in him all the human beings and all the creations moving about. And he couldn't bear it anymore. He said, I don't want to see it again. Shri Krishna told the Gita, spoke the Gita only to Arjuna, only to one person. He didn't tell it to even the second person because he was born 6,000 years back. That time the maturity of people was so low that he did not, he did not tell about this to anybody else but Arjuna. And this was heard by another person who wrote it down and Vyasa is the poet who wrote about it. The Gita is the Vedanta, means the end of Vedas. Vedas have got two sides. The first side is where the mantras are there to excite the right side or we can say the elements and the end of it is the philosophy. And he used that philosophy of Gita. He used that Vedanta philosophy in Gita to explain what is knowledge, what is God, what is spirit, how to achieve it and what happens. Now Krishna's basic character of his advent was that so far for Rama he was the one who lived like a human being and established a special place or say established a special character of a benevolent king for other kings to follow. But this one when he came he found that the whole place was filled with ritualism, with all kinds of dead uh, supra-conscious activities and subconscious activities and people were indulging into materialistic things and were very unhappy. So he established himself as the incarnation of the play, Leela. That the whole world is just a drama. It's just a drama and you are a witness to it. Actually what happens when you watch a drama, you feel that you are in it. Supposing there is Napoleon or somebody who is in the drama, you start feeling you are Napoleon. And even when you go home, you talk like Napoleon for a while. You carry on the joke with you. But it's a drama. It's outside you. It is not you. Sometimes when there is say a cinema or something we see. We identify ourselves with the scene so much that we cry, we sometimes feel very excited. But when the drama is over, then we suddenly realize 
book part. It was a drama. In the same way, this whole life, human life, is a drama. And the whole drama is only seen when you get your realization, you become a witness. Now those who have got realization should understand that you have become now a witness. Start seeing everything and you'll be amazed. You'll feel, oh, I'm so much away, I'm just witnessing. There's a Sahajogini who, come from, who came from India and she had never travelled before anywhere, even by plane she had never travelled before and comes from a very traditional family, she has never been out without somebody going with her, such a person. She got her realization and she came to America. She told me that I never felt that I was going to America, that I was going by plane anywhere, that I should be frightened, nothing of the kind. And they were all telling me, be careful. I was wondering, what, is, what are they worried about? I was least bothered. The whole thing looked like a drama. I got into the plane, I came here and there was a sea of human beings. I couldn't see my brother. I, and I think I got lost. I said, all right, if I'm lost, it doesn't matter. I've never lost because I'm with myself. So I was going to the taxi fellow. I was going to tell him, take me down to my brother's place. Then suddenly the brother got her, got to her and found her. But otherwise she was saying, I was so relaxed. I was least bothered, most surprising. I was witnessing the whole drama without any, without any uh, consideration about it or any awareness about it, I was just doing it automatically. That's what happens to you. You see the death and you see the life and you see the drama and you do not get involved into it. When you are not involved into it, then you are completely at ease and at peace. As I gave you the example that if you are in the water, then you are worried about the waves. But supposing you get into the boat, then you see the waves as fun. Or if you know how to swim, also you can see it as a fun. So when you get realized, when you get your realization, then the whole thing becomes like a drama and you start developing <coughs> your detachment. So he is the Yogeshwara. He is the one who is fully detachment. He is a full detachment. Though he was a king, though he was having a very luxurious life, he was a detached personality. Now he on this earth when he came, he had to have his powers with him. And he didn't know how to bring those powers in human beings because he knew he won't be able to give realization to people at that time, 6,000 years back. So he created a method by which he got 16,000 wives and all these wives were nothing but his powers carrying people and there's a big story about it which I think every Indian knows and you can also find out. <coughs> he had five, I mean he became the king, he did all this and he had five uh, elements as his wives. So his own queens, five of them were five elements and 16,000 wives were actually uh, his own powers manifested as human beings. And he came on this earth as Krishna, Krishi. Krishi means agriculture, means actually sowing. He sowed the seed, he sowed the seed of spirituality. He said, Nainam chidanti shastrani, Nainam dahati pavaka, Nachainam kledayantyapo, Nasho sayati maruka means this spirit cannot be killed, it cannot be sucked in, it cannot be destroyed, neither it can be transformed, is eternal. And to prove that Christ came on this earth at this point and He by His resurrection proved it, that it cannot be killed. Now I will tell you about Sri Krishna's life as a diplomat. He was a diplomat. He was the incarnation of diplomacy and the best diplomacy is such that you give such conditions which are absurd. If you give absurd conditions, then a person gets toppled down over it and then he succumbs. Because if you approach directly someone, then the people are very half-baked and they start intellectualizing everything and rationalizing. 
So better thing is put a proposition before them, which is absurd, and let them find out for themselves, and then they come to you with surrendered mind. Now I'll explain to you how. Arjuna was his disciple, and Arjuna, when he went to war with Kauravas, who were the satanic forces in those days, got into a mood of despondence. And he said that, these are, in these are my relations, these are, there's my, one of my gurus who taught me how to use the arrow, and how am I to fight these people? So then he told the Gita, that time he spoke the Gita to him. And he said that, the first thing he said, that you should find yourself, you must have self-knowledge, you should get realization, you should have the knowledge. Knowledge doesn't mean uh, the idea about this architecture and all that, right. but knowledge is the awareness of your spirit. So Arjuna being a, that time a mediocre, I should say, an intellectual, he asked him a question. As usual, intellectuals are good at asking questions, never giving answers. So the intellectual asked him that you are telling us to go to war and here you are telling me to find my spirit. How do these two things meet? Because according to many people who are talking today also, that a man who is realized should not fight. He should sit down and bear all the brands of the things upon himself. He should suffer. So he said that, how do you say that I become the spirit and then I have to fight these evil forces? Why should I fight these <coughs> evil forces then? So he said that, all right. He is a person who is a mediocre, it's very difficult to tell him how to do it. Actually, it is very simple. When you are a witness, you can fight better. You have to fight the evil forces. Why are you enlightened if you cannot fight the darkness? You have been made a light to fight the darkness and not to be happy with yourself, oh, I am the light, I am the light, I am the light. But you have to fight the darkness and this they would not accept that why should we fight the darkness? So he said, all right. What you do is to do what you want to do and put the fruit of your doing at the lotus feet of the Lord. Now this is absurd. This is an absurd condition. Like you do your karmas, but put the fruit of that at the lotus feet of the Lord. It is an absurd condition. You just can't do it. Why? because you have got Mr. Ego sitting down there. Whenever you do something, you always say you are doing it. And even if you say, oh, I have married Christ and this is God's work I am doing, you may say it. But in your heart of heart it is not so. Because you have not got that hollow personality where there is no ego. You must get rid of this ego, otherwise you are doing the work and you are conscious. The myth, actually human beings don't do anything whatsoever. It's a myth. For example, we have built this beautiful church. Now what have you got? Whatever was created by God, you just change the forms of that and put it. Dead from the dead. What living work have you done? You cannot transform one flower into a fruit, can you? So it's a myth. We believe in that we do this, we do that, we do this. Actually, you don't do anything. You only change forms of the dead from this to that. And this myth that you have got, that you do, accumulates here as this bile colored stuff on your head. It can be quite big. Here it is shown, it can be so big as that, even bigger than your body, bigger than this big dome. The one who must have been, this must have been. Maybe having a bigger thing than that can be possible, you see, and then you walk like this on the road. You don't know how to balance yourself. With all this big thing on your head all the time, this ego telling you, oh, you are the great. And you meet such a person, better be careful. Keep away from people who have done great works, otherwise they will use you for something else. So keep away from all such people. That's what is the best. So this Mr. Ego develops into a big <laughs> And when it develops, it just gives you ideas that 
First of all, it makes you think, oh, you are great, you are very great. And then sometimes you get punches on it because people don't accept you as that great as you think yourself to be. Then with a punch it grows even bigger. With one more punch it's like a rubber uh, balloon. See, you punch it, it goes up. Again you punch it, it both ways is horrible. It can be pumped in or it can be punched in. And once it is punched in, then it can be very, very big and then you don't know what to do, so you recoil down into your left should be here. Then you say, oh, I should not have done it. Because you think by doing that your ego is hurt. You just go there to feel guilty because you think by doing that your ego is hurt. Your image is spoiled. Your so-called image of this big balloon is spoiled so you feel hurt. Now this happening of giving it or surrendering it at the lotus feet of Lord can only happen when your realization takes place. Now those people who have got realization, what do you do? You say, Mother, it is going, it is coming. It's not going, it's not going. You become a third person. You raise the Kundalini, say you have a friend, you bring the friend along. Now the friend doesn't get realization. You don't say, I have given realization. You don't say, I raise the Kundalini. But what you do is to say, that mother is not yet working, it's little hot beside, there's a, this finger burning, this chakra is catching. But you say everything in the third person. You never say, I do. Even if your son is not realized or if your father is not realized, you will tell him, I'm sorry, you can't get realization. It is not working, it. You become the third person. And that is what it is when it flows, you say, it's going, it's working, it's there. This is the theory that he tried, tried to propound, that the whole thing should become, the karma should become a karma, like the sun. The sun shines, but sh the sun doesn't, is not conscious that it is shining, it's just emitting, it's not bothered, it's not conscious of it. It comes, it changes so many leaves, it gives them color, gives oxygen, does all kinds of things and it goes back, it's bothered. It is just emitting, it does not require any kind of a self-satisfaction that I have done it, I am doing. That kind of a thing should happen to you when you just become an akar. That is what he was saying. This is the karma theory of Sri Krishna. But he said that a day will come when you will get your realization and then this karma will be sucked. Christ is the embodiment of all that Krishna prophesied or said, he came on this earth to prove it. The second thing that he talked about is about the bhakti yoga, that you must you worship by your this son, that you must worship God, that you must surrender yourself to God. Now, when we say that we pray to God, we ask for Him, I mean we ask everything, I mean the way we ask God all the time really, something so horrible, like we'll say that now I want to have a divorce, get can cancer for my wife or do this for, I mean all sorts of things we ask for. We say that we are in the war, we should win, the enemy should be lost and all sorts of things we ask for God. I mean God must be fed up the way we ask things. <laughs> but whatever it is, to surrender at the lotus feet of God, through your worship, Krishna has been diplomatic again. He said that if you have to do bhakti, worship, it should be ananya, ananya. Now this word is the most diplomatic and he used it again and again with all these scholars and all these people have missed it. Ananya means when there is not the other, when you are connected. You must do this surrendering when you are connected, which is very true. Without connection, if you start doing any bhakti, whom are you doing the bhakti? If there is no connection, supposing I am sitting in London, you are here. You are writing letters after letters, letters after letters, I never receive them, I never read them, I have nothing to do with it. So what's the use? You must have some connection with God Almighty, then whatever bhakti you do, it has a meaning. 
So before realization, the bhakti has no meaning. Like these mad people, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. By saying these things, if you can achieve anything, then it is the easiest. But the one thing that you spoil is the center. You spoil the worst of all and they always get throat cancer. The reason is that first of all you spoil the center. You spoil the center because you go on saying Hare Rama, Hare Krishna too many times. What is there to take God's name like that? It's very, very cheap thing. If you are realized, you don't have to take God's name like that. There's a protocol of God. If you have to take His name, you have to take it properly with a protocol even after realization. But you just want to say, Christ, 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 Christ on the way. Christ will be so angry with you, what is it? Is he such a cheap thing? First of all, you will spoil the name here by taking, I mean mechanically, I mean physically you will spoil this thought. I mean when I also speak too much, I have to get some sort of a uh, soothing thing for my throat. So you can imagine a person who is not realized, who has no idea as to what name to be taken. He takes that name all the time, the mantras so called that are given to you. You get spoiled spoil this, plus you spoil your this mantra because you this left side because you have taken the unauthorized name of Shri Krishna. So you are in for a throat cancer. If you want to get it, you better join this Hare Rama Hare Krishna. Well, and they think they are very near Krishna. How will they recognize Shri Krishna? But this chakra is the best among us for one reason. If this chakra is spoiled, say, smoking spoils it a little bit in the beginning. If it is too much smoking, it spoils very bad. Then the, from the cervical plexus, the nerves go down on both the sides. And the sensitivity in the hands is so little that when <coughs> you start feeling the vibration, you may feel a jet of air coming out of your head, a great jet, but in the hand you may not feel anything at all. At all, there are many who just don't feel anything. For the, in the beginning they just don't feel because their are, hands are no sensitive. They have done greatest harm to their cervical plexus. And that's why this chakra is stopped. It doesn't give you the sensitivity. Though the Kundalini has passed through, but gradually then Kundalini spreads on the sides and gives energy to this center which passes through the system and then you start feeling in the hand the all-pervading power which is the knowledge. Otherwise people don't feel it. They may feel it in the head but not in the hand. I'm, I was really shocked when I came here nine years back that this country was nothing but a chimney. That time, everyone, whether it was a woman or a man or a child, everyone used to smoke. And so much of smoking that really I didn't know how this we should be, the America is going to hear. Now, please pay attention here, all right? Don't turn around your heads. Huh? Now, this center should be used in such a manner that you keep your collectivity. A person who is an individualist, who keeps away from collective beings, who does not give vibrations, sits at home before my photograph wants to take vibrations and all that, such a person will not be able to progress much in Sahaja Yoga. This has an inlet and an outlet. Unless and until you give there is an outlet, there will not be the inlet of vibrations. With your hands you give to others. Now the fourth thing Krishna has said is the Raj Yoga, in which you get Kundalini awakening and you get all these chakras active. He has given actually the action into which they move. <coughs> like the bandhas take place, how these chakras go and sort of catch hold of the part of the Kundalini and hold it up. And how these bandhas take place, all you have described, is the thing that happens when Kundalini starts. 
like one can describe that when the car starts the car starts moving and the all the other uh small bolts and nuts and all of them are there they also start then moving one after another the whole mechanism the works you can say start it manifesting itself in the same way within us this starts working this is what he said but people are using it for kriya yoga which is nonsense like you sit down hold your stomach but the kundalini has not started why are you holding your stomach and hold your nose then you hold this ears what is the use the kundalini has not just started why are you doing all this nonsense you see there is this uh, your yogananda who will start this nonsense to you of kriya yoga i mean hard the amount of diseases one can get from this i mean unnecessarily you shave your head why to shave your head by shaving your head are you going to go to god then why has he given you hair they shave their head nonsense it is absolutely to shave your head the sheep is shaved every week every year twice and by shaving your head you are not going to go to god these all nonsensical ideas you shave your head wear a funny dress walk seriously like this and you will go to god one must understand that the happening has to take place the kundalini awakening has to take place itself it is a spontaneous the living thing by doing all this artificial thing you are spoiling yourself completely it automatically happens but all this mechanism you don't have to worry because once the kundalini rises it happens what is actually i now feel that krishna never knew that human beings really so mad for example supposing if your car has not started do you start moving its machinery by hand and believe that the car has started moving is the most absurd thing to do to spoil the car and that's what exactly you do when you try to do this kriya yoga there is a kriya you don't have to do any action the action takes place by itself it is built in it is within it i'll give you another example supposing there's a seed and you want to sprout it will you try to pull the primule out of it will it sprout is that senseless i tell you the way people try to do all this trick standing on the head and god has given us legs to stand not the head to stand i don't know from where this idea has come that you stand on your head by that kundalini is never awakened it is for a certain disease that that head stand is good but not for everyone it's for a cure of a disease that's all all sorts of funny ideas even people drink curing i mean all sorts of things they do nonsensical things you know to get to realization there was one lady of nimkori baba is another horrible fellow and she came to me she was like this like this like this i told her what did you do there at what did you do with this man oh mother he blessed me specially i said what he gave me his water i said his water what is his water is <laughs> and this is the water she drank for days together for years together and now she says i can't forget him you imagine to bring god to that level i mean can there be a greater blasphemy and ridiculous way of treating god almighty who has created you there's no respect no respect you don't respect yourself you don't respect your chastity you don't respect your private parts how can you respect god this is what it is and they teach you not to respect and this is what happens when you start reading gita you see they are all blind people blind people can't read gita blind people cannot read but they never understand they will never understand the inner meaning of it and they'll just twist it for their own sake <laughs> now the left hand side is the word that gives you what you call the guilt feeling i don't know who to blame now for example say the churches the catholic churches i mean when did christ say that you are guilty from where did they pick up this i cannot say from where they picked it up christ could never have said that you are guilty that you should feel guilty that you should suffer i mean from childhood if you tell somebody that you are guilty he'll pick up automatically it's a conditioning on the person he will devise methods to find out that what guilt he has after all you are a human being and you can make mistakes and you are blind god knows that and he also knows 
that all your mistakes are to be forgiven. They are to be forgiven and you are to be given realization. He is worried about his own creation, isn't he? Is he going to waste you only because you have committed some mistakes here and there? And what mistakes can you commit? That's also, let's see. He is the ocean of love. He is the ocean of compassion. He is the ocean of forgiveness. He is ocean. And you are a drop in the ocean. And how much a drop can carry a dirt that he cannot cleanse? Think of it. Think of it when you say you are guilty. This is a fashion that is developed here and sometimes I find this guilt is nothing but this Mr. Ego curls up into it and says, all right, I am guilty, finished. It is not facing the fact. Supposing you have done the mistake, what's the use of saying, I have done the mistake, I have done the mistake, I have done the mistake? Do you correct it? Do you correct it by that, saying that I have done the mistake, now I have done the mistake? It would be something, say we got lost in the car and we went into another road. Now we sit down there crying, oh, we have made the mistake, better sit down. Here people are waiting for me, all right, for the program. And I am sitting down there crying, we have done the mistake, we have come to the wrong line, we should not have been there. If I have done the mistake, correct it and come back to the right position. Go on correcting it. Instead of that, this is the best way of sitting down saying, we have done the mistake, I should not have done this, I should not have done this, putting down yourself, I can't do it, to be, to be diffident all the time, oh, I just can't do it. This could be very dangerous, very dangerous. For example, supposing in an accident you have harmed somebody. Now you sit down there, oh, I have done the mistake, I have committed the mistake, oh, please get hold of that person whom you have harmed, take him to the hospital, get him treated. This is the way we do not face by feeling guilty. It is a very good way of Mr. Ego to coil up into the left we should be and say, oh, you are guilty. Who are you to judge yourself? Why do you judge yourself? How do you judge yourself? You have no method of judging yourself. All the time you find out ways and methods of feeling diffident in life. And such diffident people, what are they going to do? You have to take swords in your hand of honesty and of dedication to God's work. There they are standing with the sword like this. They can't even handle a little stick in their hand. What are they going to do? because they are all very guilty people all the time shaking. Why to feel guilty by making yourself so diffident and useless warrior of God's work? This guilt is the worst thing and in Sahaja Yoga the first mantra always I ask you to say, I am not guilty. You don't judge yourself like that. You have no business to condemn yourself. God has created you with such difficulties. Now understand, you are above everything that is much above these things, much above all these flowers, much above all the stars and all the sky that is created. And here you are, like fools, you are feeling guilty and sitting down at home and spoiling the work of God. You have to get to your realization, you have to get to your absolute, you have to get to your own being and become what you are and not to waste all the work that he has done here. How he must be fit, how much he has done for you to become you. And here you are on a small thing, you just slip out and spoil the complete work. Is this the way to behave towards your father and towards your mother and towards Christ, their son? Is this the way to treat? We have to stand up with courage, with fearlessness. This gives you fear, unnecessary botheration and worries and you start thinking about things which do not exist, all imagined. Left Vishuddhi is a curse of modern times. And I would request you all to come out. Every morning you tell yourself that I am not guilty. You must say it thrice in the morning and thrice in the evening. What is there to feel guilty about? 
I wish Christ had included this in the prayer. But you have to forgive yourself first of all. I mean, you could never have imagined that humans, human beings would be so stupid as to all the time say that I am guilty, I can't forgive myself. Human beings have escapes for everything. Now this is a new modern method they have devised of running away from reality. Reality is to be faced and to be enjoyed. It is called as Raj. It's the one that has to permeate it, joy. <coughs> you come and sit on the throne <coughs> and enjoy. <coughs> Today my wish is out. Now, I have been able to tell you <coughs> in short about the Shuddhi Chakra. Let's go to the another chakra here, which is called as the Agya. Agya Chakra resides in the center of optic chasma. Optic chasma is the one which crosses each other and in the center of it is the special center called as Agya Chakra. It is a very subtle center and this center is adorned by our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the son of Mahalaj. Is the son of the entire power that resides is the Mahalakshmi, the Viratangana, the wife of Virata, the power of the primordial. She, he is the son created by her and is very well described in the Devi Purana and other books, which are not yet translated, I think, in English, as Mahavish. He is called as Mahavish. So the Vishnu's greater form but he is the son of Vishnu. He is the son of Sri Krishna. Sri Krishna has described him as somebody who is the Adhar, is the support of the whole universe. He has given him a higher position than himself. See. And he said, this one, when he will be coming on this earth, he will prove all that I have said. He will prove because he will be the essence he will be the Omkara, he will be the all-pervading power. He will walk on the water. Not only but he will be resurrected, his body will be resurrected. He has described him fully there and he has given him the highest position that he is the Adhar, he is the support because he lives there at the Muladhara also, at the support of the root and he decides. Actually, he is the Vice Chancellor of this university, we can say that at every point we have to have him to certify. If he is not there, you cannot, you cannot awaken the Kundalini. If you don't believe in him, you cannot retain your realization. Yesterday a lady asked me, can we not do it without Christ? I said, I am sorry. Without Christ, because he is all pervading. He is the Unkara, He is the one who is the power, He is the one who is flowing in us, He is the Spirit. Now if you are seeking the Spirit, how can you do it without it? It's an absurd question. It is He came on this one and this being a narrow path, He had to pass through it to prove what Krishna has said that it cannot be killed, He got Himself crucified. It was a drum played by him. His mother was the Holy Ghost, was the part that is the Mahalakshmi, but she didn't say a word about it. She didn't say it. Because if he had said it, people would have put their attention to her. And he is bestowed with eleven powers of destruction. He's such a powerful person. You may show him as a lanky panky fellow because that satisfies your Sadism. You want to see Christ like that? He was not like that. He was, is only painted by, I think, Rubens very well, but
but the best is that in the Sistine Chapel where Michelangelo has really boldly painted him the way he was. He was a tall, not very tall, but quite tall and a very healthy and a hefty person with a big stomach. He is known as Lambodai with a big stomach. And he could carry such a huge big cross on his back. So people, when they showed him, I think mean, I was amazed at it. How could they show Christ in such a miserable state? How could they do it? I mean, horrible it is. This is just their own expression. That's how they wanted him to be. These are the people who must have definitely crucified Christ because they like to see him so miserable and unhappy. How can a person who is a realized soul be that? He has to be a cheerful person, fiery, dynamic. It has to be a healthy person, a miserable person, supposing before you stands and talks like this. Are you going to believe that person? But this is the way they have treated Christ throughout. They have maligned him and they have treated him there. He's been crucified so many times. I find it impossible to believe that how these people are reborn who crucified him again and again and again they are crucified. The crucifixion is not the message. That's why I also don't like people to wear the cross. I, I can't see the cross. It's not. Cross, of course, is very helpful because if the, if the bad spirits see the cross, they run away. But it is a reminder of something which was unbearable. Because the mother had all the power, she was Mahalakshmi. He had eleven powers, eleven powers to destroy. You can imagine, he has still those powers. And he had to go through all that without destruction. He saw to it. Now people may say, how was he resurrected? First of all, they have an objection to immaculate conception. I mean, they have objection for everything. He was not a human being. He was the divine power. I conceive you in my heart. Do you know that? And I put my Kundalini and I put you on my, from my heart into it, and I take you out. The way you have got your second birth, in the same way Christ watched his immaculate But she put him in the heart and into the uterus down below, and she created him. It's very easy to doubt him and say things against him, because he is no more. And the Jews must learn a lesson now. They denied him once and they have suffered. Now don't deny him again. You cannot deny the person, the embodiment of this divine power. Christians may be blown off. If Christians have tortured you, forget them. They are just the same as you are, fanatics, fanatics, fanatics. Whether they are Christians or they are Muslims, Khomeini is the same as any other person. I do not find any difference whatsoever. Dogmatic, ignorant, vanity. Forget these people, they do not stand for Christ. Christ Himself has said in second chapter, Matthew, second verse, you'll be calling me Christ, Christ, I won't recognize you. Who are these? The people who say Christ, we are the solicitors of Christ. We are the people who are in charge of Christ. All of these people will be charged and they will be thrown away in the hell, the way they have managed things about Christ. Some of them are genuine. They don't know that this is artificial. They are genuinely, but they must get their realization. They must ask for their real realization, and they must know what is Christ within themselves. They have to awaken this Christ here. Now, as I was telling you that Christ said that you are to be born again, that I am to be born in your heart. Now, the heart center is here as well as here, because the heart is controlled by the center at the fontanel bone A. Eh? And that's what he said, that you should get your realization, when he said you should be put in the heart. Now the people of various countries, even your country, went down to India. And they never told that Christ was born, who was the Mahavishnu, <coughs> because he's already described in the Quran. 
that he is the adhara is the one who will be once awakened in the kundalini by the kundalini will suck your karmas they never went and told so the indians went on with their karma theory and these gurus have come here to teach you karma it is amazing how you accept all these theories of nonsense like they say that you have to suffer because you have done bad karma then they may say that yes you can give your a balance but you go this way or that way and you just keep it to balance if that is so that you have to go to one extreme and to another extreme then what are they doing here why are they talking that you should shut up because they cannot do anything they cannot give you realization they cannot save you from this situation so it's better that you suffer but why do they say you should suffer why should they say because they want to enjoy your suffering they want you to suffer because they enjoy it more so many of these disciples who came from these horrible gurus who said you must have your karma then you must suffer told me that they saw their gurus giggling at them and mocking at them and they showed me some of the photographs they had taken of these gurus which shows complete mockery of these stupid disciples who were suffering in their body and suffering in their mind in the presence of these gurus so they have a double enjoyment one the money another is the sadism and third the greatest of all that their purpose is to kill you all and to destroy you all because you are god's men that they achieve by their falsehood because you are impressed by their falsehood now see if there was any false guru here this all would be filled the whole thing would be filled on the road there would be a jam but the real guru i have seen not only here everywhere it starts way this way of course in a place where people are very simple and who are very sensitive is a different one but the people in a city especially they are so insensitive to reality and so sensitive to devils that it is surprising they feel very much at home with the devils and very much lost with the reality because you are in false so you must know that you have to become the real you have to become that which is the spirit which is not so far is shining in your central nervous system in your awareness and this is the spirit is the one is the is christ now i've spoken before also in the churches but today for the first time i am speaking about christ in a church and that's why i was very happy that at least in this church i would say something that would establish it and that when people will come here i hope they get their realization and that something works out here they get at least awakening because so many saints are sitting in front of me maybe that one day will come in this church maybe it may work out that people will get their realization christ life was only for 3 4 years nobody allowed him to live longer than that whatever was possible was done but such stupid people such stupid people you could not talk to them and that's how they killed him he could not speak to them any more and that's how his life was finished but in that small life of his what a spark it was what a spark it the way people have behaved towards him is atrocious i must say i must say that apostles themselves because this matthews and this he was such an intellectual such an intellectual he would not accept the idea of immaculate conception very difficult man he would argue it out he said if a virgin is going to give the child then everybody is going to say that it's a very very blasphemous thing it's a very very um, illegitimate thing and it should not be spoken of horrible fellow and one better than the other and when they took up about the spreading of christianity they took it in such a funny way because they became supra conscious people they started speaking the languages of so many people that part of babel is wrong where they became not realized the wind part is all right but so many people i have seen who come to my program when they come for realization they feel the wind for a while and immediately they shunt up and become supra conscious 
Now we'll see what is supraconscious entry and the subconscious entry. Now you see here there are two buttons. These are the two petals. One controls, of course, the pituitary that controls the ego, and the pineal that controls the super ego. But this also has a capacity to blow this out this way and blow this out this way. Supposing you become supraconscious or start to start thinking too much about something about the future, what must be the galaxy, we should find out about it and you must find out about the stars and about all these things and about future, about say um, prophecies, what else is that is uh, astrology and all these. You see, futuristic. You people are mostly futuristic. You try to plan, you try to do, and every plan fails, of course. But this thinking of planning of too much can push this up this side. Too much. Actually, as shown here, is this side, but actually, when it is placed, it is placed like this. The ego is placed like this, and the super ego is like this. Here, we could not show the three dimensions. So, from the back to this side is the super ego, and from here to here, is the ego. Now this ego bloats out this way, into this side. And when it bloats out this side, it goes into the supraconscious area. So it comes up this side. Now the supraconscious area gives you visions, hallucinations, LSD does that. LSD does that. Then you start seeing some eye of a person who is a dead person but a very ambitious person. For example, you might get the vision of Hitler. You might get the vision of, uh, <coughs> say, all these horrible kings. You might get to see colors. You may set, see auras. And one has to understand here that these aura starts coming to us because we shift, we disintegrate from our being. That's how we start seeing something else separated from us. To see auras is not a good sign. If you are seeing auras, we have to bring you back to the same position because you have to be in the present and not in the future. You get disintegrated. For example, if there is a machine, say, which takes the aura, auras. I was talking to someone who has done that work of uh, aura picturing. Now, before, after realization, you don't get any auras in a person, you cannot get any auras in a person because it's integrated completely integrated. But when he is in a mess, you start getting the auras. Like if he has cancer, you will get auras. If he has, is an alcoholic, you will get auras. They kind of be crazy auras. A normal person may have auras, not so much crazy. But auras you cannot feel when the whole thing is integrated. You can see in a, in a say, light. If there is no aberration, that means it's a good light. If there is aberration, then it's a bad light. All the seven, seven colors of a light has to be concentrated and has to be integrated. If they are prismatic and if they are giving you separately, then it is not one integration. And when it is one integration, then you cannot see seven lights. So the person is not integrated. Now all these auras come to us because we are made of seven type of cocoons within us. But the people who are on the right side only believe in the five cocoons. They call them koshas. I don't think if I have time for that. But these are the koshas are the created by, one is created by the first center, by the second center, by the third center. This is the physical goal, things. by the fourth one, then the fifth one. And the sixth and the seventh are the things that they do not create for us outside. They create inside near the heart. And these are created near the heart, but as soon as you get your realization, they all become one. They all merge into one and that is the spirit. <coughs> so as if you can say, when the spirit exists in a prismatic state, then you get the auras of seven. But when it becomes <coughs> integrated, that you become one, all the auras become one.
So integration is the aim of Sahaja Yoga. And now I think I have told you how you can also go to the subconscious area the same way. The subconscious area you can move on the left hand side. If you move into collective subconscious area, say for example, you can be triggered into cancer. By this triggering, you might get heart attacks and things like that, diabetes now. Many people believe sugar gives you diabetes is nonsense. Sugar doesn't give you diabetes. What gives you diabetes is too much thinking. Those who do not think too much never get, Indian farmers never get diabetes, they don't know what disease is. Because you think too much, you work too much, this center works too much. It has to create food for the brain, it has to replace the brain center. And these brain centers are to be replaced. For that it creates out of fat the new centers, the evolved, evolved uh, cells that are sent here. And because of that work, if it is too much, it neglects the other things which it has to work out throughout. One of them is the spleen, another is pancreas. And when it neglects the pancreas, you get diabetes. Not by sugar. Of course, sugar because it has to convert it into fat. But if you do not have sugar, then it's a double work. If you have sugar, it converts it into fat and makes it useful for your brain. But if you think too much then and you don't take sugar, it's a double action. But if you just take sugar and do not think, also can be problematic because he has to convert too much of uh, into fat. You see, so too much work is given, there is no balance. So one has to understand that too much sugar is not good, but you must take sugar because the sugar is needed and stop your thinking. How do you stop your thinking? Only by rising above the Agya Chakra. This is a very, very important point at Agya that you must know that the thinking stops. Now the thinking comes to you like this, like a wave. It rises, the thought and falls off. Another thought rises and falls off. In between there is a place called as Vilamba. Now when the thought rises, it automatically falls down. You can see the rising of the thought, thought but not falling off. Now this place, space is the place of present. This rises either from the ego or superego and goes into the past. The in between <coughs> space is the present. One is the future, one is the past. Now this space has to increase. When it increases, <coughs> then what happens is that Agya Chakra opens more and you become thoughtless here. You become thoughtlessly aware. You come in the present. There's no thought. And thought is the barrier between the creation and ourselves. For example, you look at this, say, a beautiful stone that is placed there or anything. You watch it. Now, if you want to think, oh, it looks like a man, it looks like a devil, or it looks like a god, or whatever it is, there's a thought you have to So what you do when you are realized, you just watch, watch. And whatever the joy is put there of the creator, of an artist, completely is within you, because there is no thought, there is no weight, there is no disturbance in a completely silent lake. All that is around it, all that creation comes in, absolutely reflective, and you enjoy it with thoughtless awareness, called as nirvichar samadhi. This complete nirvichara, where you have no thought and you start enjoying that creation completely. The joy of that is there, nothing is lost. So the thoughtless awareness comes in when the Kundalini crosses this Agya Chakra. It does double work. First it makes you thoughtlessly aware. Secondly, because the Kundalini, if it has pierced through, it pushes these and she fills these with the grace. The grace falls on this. When the grace comes in, you start relaxing. These centers also relax. These centers are in attention. But when the grace comes in, they go back into normal. So there is more sort of expansion and the thoughtless awareness starts establishing itself at the Agya Chakra. Now the mantra of Agya Chakra is the Lord's Prayer. It has got two sides, hum and cha. Hum means I am, 
And shab means I forget. So if supposing this is catching, you have to say I forget. If there is ego within us, you should say I forget. If there is super ego within us, you should say I am. I am. So it is ham and sham is the bija, is the seed, is the seed of the prayer, Lord's prayer. Now there are people who are talking the Lord's prayer is not all right. I mean, who are you? What do you know about it? Everybody is challenging everyone. What do you know? What is your authority? The trouble is, everybody is entitled to do what they like with religion and with God. Though they do not know anything about it, they are absolutely ignorant, but they think they have a right because there is no political control over it. Even Hitler can talk about Christ. Anybody can talk about him and about the prayer that he taught you. Who are you to challenge it? Who are you to challenge him? I can't understand. How do you challenge a person without knowing your own position in relation to him? But this is a very, very common thing that people do and is due to ego. Ego makes you high-handed and this is the worst type of high-handedness that you challenge God, you challenge Christ, you challenge everything which you don't understand. Your mind is limited. It's a very limited way. You cannot do anything with this mind of yours. You have to go beyond it. Somebody has to trigger you into the space. You have to go into there. You have to become the spirit. Only by realizing your spirit you can get connected with God. Before that you are not connected. That's why you have to become the spirit. And the spirit is the connection, is the link with God. There is no other way you can be linked with God. If you want to keep yourself in delusion, you go ahead with it. But this is the real thing I'm telling you, the true thing I'm telling you, for which you should know you cannot pay, you cannot purchase it, you cannot demand it, and you cannot work it out. The grace of God has to come, fall upon you to do it, or a person who is enlightened can only enlighten. Now, about Christ, if I have to speak, I have spoken once on Christ for seven days, one after There is no end to it. There is such a great incarnation that I just do not know how to say that is the… I have spoken all about it. As it is, we have many tapes in London, you can send for it. We are now going to have a center here. Harman has offered his place. And we'll be sending those tapes there. At least 300 tapes you have got in London, which you can listen to and see for yourself. And all of these tapes are uh, very good because they are actually mantras. They work out the mantras, and you you also get listening to them, opening of your centers and all that. Now the last, which is embarrassing because he already has told you that. I am supposed to have been here. It is the integration. The end of it is the integration of all these seven centers. All these seven centers are placed around this area called as the limbic. This is the limbic. Now, if you cut it, the brain, like this transfer section of the brain, you'll find it. It's like a lotus. You can find it that there is the marking is like a lotus opened up and is thousand petals as called are like this. But the coloring is not all right. Uh, you people are so fond of these special colors so they have used it but we can say that this kind of a thousand petal is there. Now it is said in the Bible that I, I will appear before you like tongues of flames and these are they appear, they all appear, but these are very large ones. And they appear as living, living flames in different colors, starting from one to another, and they are thousand in number. Now the doctors argue that they cannot be thousand, they have to be hundred and ninety-two. I mean, just imagine this foolish people to argue on that, but they do not know they are thousand in number and they are placed here. But in the limbic area, all the seven centers are surrounded. Like 
we have got now. You see from here, this is the Agya Chakra. Here, behind it, here at the back, just exactly at the back is the Muladhar. Surrounding it is this Swadishtha. Surrounding the Muladhara is the Swadishtana. If you are catching on Swadishtana, you can feel it within yourself, the heaviness here. If you are catching, say you have diabetes, give an example. Diabetic people get blind after some time. They lose the power of the eyes because this thing oppresses the optic lobe, which is controlled by the Muladhara chakra. We call it as back arm, this portion at the back. So this is the Swadhisthana chakra here at the back. In the center here you find a bone, that's the Muladhara, and around it is the Swadhisthana chakra. Then here is the Vishuddhi chakra, is the Virata, is the Vishuddhi chakra here. When you catch cold, you'll find you'll have a problem here. But if you apply something here, you'll feel better. And this is the Vishuddhi chakra, which is related to your throat, this one. Now, if you have problems with collectivity also, you might find a big uh, block here. Now, at the back of it is the Nabi here, at the back. This Nabi has a left and a right side. As we have shown here, the left Nabi and the right Nabi. There are two left and right Nabi. I don't know if I have told you about that left, right Nabi. But, uh, I mean, in the, you can find out from the book that there is left and right Nabi. So you have got a left and a right Nabi. And also, you sometimes feel the Nabi in here. Some people do feel, uh, who have uh, problems with their gurus and things like that, you see, then you feel it. But the whole void is here. And this void is called as Ekadasha Rukha, this void, the whole of it. It goes like a ring now. And this ring is very important because this you get it from the void. If you go to a bad guru or someone, you get this. And this is the one that is of the rider, the rider, the one who has eleven powers of destruction, the one who is going to come to slash up. Then he is not going to give you any counsel, he is not going to redeem you, no realization. He will slash out those who are not realized and he will emancipate the one who are realized. If that's the last, that you don't ask just now, give some time more to save more people because he is not going to question anyone, he is not going to allow you any more time and that will be the time of complete destruction of all the satanic forces. So that is the Ekadasha here. That collects because all these horrible gurus are here. These are the Ekadashas. And this is one thing is to be understood that one should get rid of this very easily. Now these two children of Rama who were born here and were endowed on the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon both are here. And the sun became, as I told you, Buddha ultimately here and he became the, not ultimately, uh, the Mahavira. They are here. But they, when they were on this earth, Buddha talked about non-violence and people thought non-violence to chickens, to to uh, bugs, these Mahavira people, these Jains, we have got horrible uh, community called Jains in India. And they believe in vegetarianism to this extent that they get a Brahmin, pay him money and put him in a hut and bring all the bugs of the village, put that, those in the hut and the bugs live on that Brahmin. It's a fact, even today they do. And then they pay some money to the Brahmin because the bugs are fed. Now, you just tell me this kind of a nonsensical vegetarianism. Am I going to give realization to chickens? Just think of it, or to the bugs, or to the earthworms. You are human beings. You should eat a flesh which is not of a bigger animal than yourself, because that's horrible. But you can eat the flesh of the animals which are smaller than you. There's no harm in eating that. And this kind of a nonsensical vegetarianism, don't do any harm to the animals. But they don't mind doing these giants are the greatest. They are, you see, such just like suckers. And they don't mind killing people for their money. They don't mind going for what you call shikars in uh, hunting and killing anything. 
but they will not eat uh, a chicken or even the garlic. Now garlic, as you know, is very good for the heart, but they don't eat garlic. It's very good for the heart, it's very good for people who have got a uh, tendency towards hardening of the arteries. So the circulation is a problem, it's very good to eat that and for cold. Those people who suffer from cold, if they regularly eat a fresh garlic thing in the night, brush their teeth, they'll be much better off. So while talking about it, I would say. Now these seven centers are here. Now at the Fontenelle is the center of the heart. Now just imagine, it is at the center. So where do I exist? I mean all of them are seven centers, so I'm just like a bubble. But if I'm in your heart, I'm there. So the key of Sahaja Yoga that you have to recognize me. If you cannot recognize me, you cannot progress in Sahaja Yoga, I have to frankly admit it because he's already exposed me. I don't tell this in my first lectures, but I have to say that please now recognize me. As your mother, I would request you to recognize me. And you don't have to give me anything, just take things from me. Just have it yourself, but recognize me. If you deny me, then this won't open, this will be always covered. That's why at the end when you say, Mother, give me my realization, because I have come on this earth to give you relaxation. That's my job. It's one of the worst jobs that one can have. <laughs> because, uh, because it is so difficult with people to talk to them, to tell them about it, and they are all the time up in arms. Uh, they are so aggressive and they start fighting. It's the mother's job, which is a thankless job, absolute thankless job. I have to do it. And also only mother can do it. Because if you had Christ, you would have taken those eleven things and finished off everyone. If you had asked Christ, uh, Krishna, he has also Samhara Shakti, he would have killed. But to use the whole thing with integrated idea and with balancing, with understanding human beings, you have to have a mother. And that's why sometimes people try to become very familiar and start taking advantage or taking liberties, which is a wrong thing. Whatever I am, I am and I'm loved. I can't help it. I really can't help it. I'm compassion. One day I did feel very disgusted, really. Once I did feel very disgusted with people the way they were, and I was just saying that, forget it. And then suddenly I saw my photograph, and I saw my eyes. Then I said, Nirmala, you are compassion. You are compassion. You can't help it. You just can't help it. I have to work it out. I know it means it means sometimes too much, too much, but I have to work it out. Now some people come out with the question, why you, mother? I said, why not you? It's a good idea. Come along and do it. <laughs> I'll be the best, it will be the best for me to retire and my husband might give you a pension for it. He'll be so happy that I've found out somebody who will replace me. But I have not yet found out somebody who will replace me. I wish you could, it will be a good idea. Now the name Nirmala itself is, means immaculate, means the one who is the cleansing part, is the name of the Goddess also. My actually sign name is Lalita, is the name of the primordial mother, is the, that is the name of the primordial mother. But to be a human being with all these centers around you working, for example for the last three days you don't know how much I am vibrating, you can ask. Warren and other people, I asked them to take the vibrations and they were doing like this, but they couldn't touch me. They tried to put the hand on the head and they were just, and they, were, they didn't know how to touch me, even if it is so much vibrating. So it's not easy to carry this, all this load on this human body, appear like a human being, to act like a human being, to behave like a human being, so that there is a report. Why an incarnation is needed? There has to be a report. Because the unconscious cannot talk to you, whatever you see in the dream comes back to you afterwards from the subconscious areas, all the ideas, so you, it's such a, such a mess, such a confusion and you cannot decide anything. So it has to come on this earth as a human being and tell you with a language. I never knew English all my life. It's the first time I learned English, but still I don't know American English. I hope I'll be able to learn. 
uh, something more by, when I travel around. And it's a thing that it's God's desire that you have to be realized. It's all written in the Bible. It's all written in all the books of the scriptures. It is very large, largely written in the books of Adi Shankaracharya, who has described me fully, in a very full way. And it's easy for Indians to get to me. I mean, though I have not much disciples in the cities, but they are aware of my advent and they know that I'm there. Most of them know about it. But uh, they can't understand why I have come to America. They say that, why do you come here? The people here won't accept. But I don't think so, because I think you are great seekers, very great seekers, born in this country. You are special type, and I have to work for you. I must say the transformation that has taken place in the Western Sahajogis has not been achieved by Indians so much. Though they have an advantage, because they are born in a country which have basics, which keeps the attention intact. The attention is very much intact, so it is easy to work it out there. Here it is difficult, it doesn't appeal to people, but still. We are all great people, so many of you are lost, but they can be all saved. But those who are here should know that you have the greatest opportunity in your lives today to be realized and to give realization to others. First of all, you have to become all right. <coughs> then you can give life to others. Now, the greatest thing that is needed for Sahaja Yoga is wisdom. And logically you will reach at a conclusion and understand that Sahaja Yoga is the end of all the problems of the world, of all the problems of the world. For example, take the capitalism and communism. Now I am a capitalist because I have all the powers. And I am the communist because I cannot enjoy it without giving it to you. But it's spontaneous. I have not to do it because I think about it. It just works. It is like that. All the problems, political problems, economic problems, everything can be solved. Krishna has said, yoga kshema vahamya. When you get your yoga, you get your well-being. He has promised. He could have said it, kshema yoga vahamya. He did not. He said, yoga kshema vahamya. First you yoga, first you night. You night with the spirit, then you are blessed by all these things. This is the center of the even material wealth of Lakshmi, which works out. And all the Sahaja Yogis who have been to me are blessed by material wealth also, but not too much like Mr. Ford. That's an extreme case. That's a headache. But they get well-being from every angle in a balanced way and integrated. So the last message is of integration, that you get completely integrated. Whatever you do, your heart supports it, your mind supports it, and your body supports it. You are completely integrated in one being, that is your spirit. May God bless you all. So now this is the last lecture and I'm going to Philadelphia and we pray that Philadelphia people get realization more and we get more people into Sahajo and that they become enlightened. Then I'll be going to Houston, then to Los Angeles and Vancouver for a day. If you have any friends or relatives there, you can write to them, take the address so that they contact and they come down the program. May God bless you. <coughs> Normally I don't tell about myself, but today he exposed me as soon as I came I had to tell because it's not tactful. It's not tactful to say anything. It's better that you discover me than I tell you because Christ was crucified, everybody was tortured. I do not want to hamper my work because it makes no difference by telling you anything before realization. It's better to tell you after realization that I am the Holy Ghost, no doubt. I am the one about which Christ has talked. I had told them, I had never said this on from a platform. And I told, they, they have been telling me, Mother, you must say that once. I said, in America I'll declare. So uh, today I declare that I am the Holy Ghost, I am the Holy Spirit who has incarnated on this earth for your realization. May God bless you. Now, any questions?
Mother, I'd just like to say, I love you. And um, I would like to, sometime tonight, take the rest of the pictures because I'm not sure the others can have. And this is my important question. How can I still my thoughts? What did you say? How can I still them? He wants to know, how can he still his thoughts? Huh? How can he still his thoughts? Why? Of any? He's making himself thoughtless. You just say, Lord's Prayer. Now, before my photograph. All right? Lord's Prayer is the entry. It's the entry. No doubt. There's a little announcement concerning all of you. There is a photograph of Mataji which is available from Tracy, who's sitting over there, which you can buy. It's a very good quality black and white photograph. And she has a few tonight. Christine will have a stock of those photographs. There is also a book called The Advent, which a few people have already received about Mataji's Advent and about Sahaja Yoga, which you'll be able to buy once you settle into Sahaja Yoga. Don't forget that Christine is here, Herman is here.